It's September 20th, 1863. It's the third day of hard, intense fighting at the Battle of Chickamauga. Old Petey, James Longstreet, has been ordered to take the Union Center, which is all right here behind me. And it's going to be very difficult. Except, all of a sudden, as Longstreet looks across the field, he notices that there's now a gap. Wood Division of the Union Army has withdrawn from the field and moved further north, creating a massive gap here in the center. Old Petey is like, okay, let's go. And brings his entire troops up through the Union Center, causing Rosencrans, commander of the Union Army here at Chickamauga, to begin fleeing back to Chattanooga. Charge. I am here at Chickamauga Battlefield, which is in North Georgia. It will be the second bloodiest, most battle, deadliest battle in the entire Civil War, just behind Gettysburg. First, before we go into this battle though, remember to subscribe and hit that notification bell so that way you're familiar anytime I upload one of these Civil War stories or any of my other class videos for recent U.S. history or film study in which I have often conversations with different filmmakers. Now, how do we get to a battle that has so much bloodshed that it becomes the second bloodiest battle of the entire Civil War? Well, first, let's rewind a little bit. After the Battle of Perryville in the fall of 1862, Union General Don Carlos Buell was relieved of the command due to his failure to capture the Confederate Army led by Braxton Bragg. Buell will be replaced by Major General William Rosecrans, who immediately developed an ambitious goal of capturing Chattanooga. But Rosie's progress will be slowed on New Year's with a costly victory at the Battle of Stones River. And for more about this battle, check out Episode 6 of Season 3. Even though Rosecrans gets the win, it takes Rosie a moment, though, to regroup from the bloody battle. Once the general regained his mojo back, Rosencrans will force Bragg to retreat at Tullahoma in central Tennessee on July 3, 1863. The victory gives the Union complete control of the Confederacy's central breadbasket. Take note that this is the same day General Meade defeated Lee at Gettysburg, and a day later Grant captures Vicksburg. Clearly, Lincoln is having an amazing 4th of July cookout. Bragg will eventually retreat to Chattanooga, and once he sees Rosecrans is still pursuing, Bragg retreats again, leaving the city free for Rosie to capture on September 7th. However, General Bragg does something partially right for once in his entire career and regroups 12 miles outside of Chattanooga in North Georgia near Chickamauga Creek, setting a trap for the Union. But take note, I said partially and we'll come back to that in a second. Nearly all of Rosecrans officers try to convince the Union General to focus on defending the recently captured city of Chattanooga. But Rosie believes that Bragg is more vulnerable and ventures away from the important city, extending his troops into North Georgia, searching for Bragg and falling into Bragg's trap. On September 18th, a couple of small skirmishes will eventually create a five mile long front along Chickamauga Creek. Although Bragg has successfully set the trap, the problem for both Bragg and Rosecrans is that both sides were in a heavy forest and neither could really see where the other side was. So yes, 
Bragg did something right in luring a Union army out of Chattanooga, but he did it by luring them into a heavy forest. Ugh. As morning broke on September 19th, chaos erupted along the battlefield as the fighting was in full confusion due to the woods. The thick woods surrounding Chickamauga Creek made it difficult to command as generals could not even see their very own troops who were literally next to them. Therefore, how do you find an enemy when you're struggling to see your own men? Both Union and Confederate armies are in a complete cluster on the 19th, advancing through woods, popping out into small fields to discover they had advanced into enemy lines and a deadly firefight. Chickamauga is rapidly developing into a chaotic mess. Now, I have shared that Braxton Bragg is the worst on several occasions in these class videos, but to give another example of why Bragg is completely horrible, this is how Bragg responds to the chaos. Bragg's officers realize their coordinated efforts are a complete mess. They are struggling in placing their own divisions on a field of combat and they are confused to where the rest of the army is on the field. To make matters worse, additionally, they do not see the entire Union Army and do not know how Rosecrans is responding. As they reach out to Bragg for clarification, Bragg responds, move to the sound of the fight. Seriously? That's your coordinated plan of attack? Bragg did not give a series of detailed movements, but simply told his officers to move to the sound of the fight. Yup, you're the worst. At the end of the day of the 19th, Bragg believes he was successful, but is frustrated that his officers were in chaos on the battlefield. Yet what Bragg fails to recall is that his orders during the day were simply, move to the sound of the fight. Way to go there, bud. That night, after the first day of fighting comes to an end, Bragg receives reinforcements. James Longstreet and his corps finally has made his way to Bragg's headquarters at midnight after a long day of travel. Bragg welcomes Longstreet and begins to review the day's actions. And looking back, he does not see any fault in his own leadership, but believes his generals failed him. Therefore, in the middle of a major battle, Braxton Bragg restructures his entire command. Never had a commander in the middle of a major battle radically changed the structure of their command. Yet, this is what Bragg does. Longstreet is surprised Bragg has now given the entire southern portion of the command for the attack to Longstreet in the morning. Old Pete Longstreet I know you just got here, and you have not seen the battlefield, nor do you know what the terrain is like, and you have not seen the enemy yet, but we need you to go ahead and attack first thing in the morning. To put this in relatable terms, this would be like a head football coach head into the lockers at a halftime of a game that is tied and replace both his offensive and defensive coordinators. And one of the coordinators he just promoted literally got to the game at halftime and had not even seen the other team play yet. No one would ever do this, ever. But Braxton Bragg is like no one ever. Meanwhile, on the other side of the battlefield, Rosecrans fears he had been whipped. Although he will consider retreating to build a strong defense at Chattanooga, like his officers had originally suggested, he decides to hold his ground and orders his men to dig in. General George Thomas, one of Rosecrans' officers, knows that his position, the furthest northern part of the Union line, would be heavily attacked the next day. Thomas also believes that if he fails, any chance of retreating to Chattanooga will be cut off for the Union Army. Tomorrow, he must hold at all cost. On the morning of September 20th, the Confederates begin to attack Union positions. Due to the confusion and poor communication, Rosecrans will begin to second guess his own defensive line. Rosie believes a hole had opened near his Union center 
and orders General Wood to move his position and to fill in that hole. But there was no hole. And when Wood does this, he actually creates the hole in the center. And this brings us back to where we started today's story. Of Rosie's troops were where they were supposed to be. Now Wood sees Confederate movements all right in front of him, but he's already been reprimanded for not obeying orders quick enough, and it's like, all right, I'll do what I'm told, because when I don't, I get in trouble. I'm not gonna get in trouble again. So he moves his entire regiment to where he's commanded further north up the line. That creates this massive opening where I'm standing at right now. Old Petey, James Longstreet, is like, okay. Bonus brings his troops through the woods to much jubilation and rebel yell, and then they're able to bring their guns up and start hitting the Union flank. Rosie, who's now realized he's in a vulnerable position, literally flees the battlefield. He's the commander of the entire Union army, and he's in a full out retreat. Along with him, is he's following other Union divisions, seeing that their commanders go in there like, well, let's go as well. The Union had been holding our line well. They weren't losing until Rosie made this very fatal mistake. When danger reared its ugly head, he bravely turned his tail no. and said, brave so love and turned about, I didn't. and gallantly he chickened out, bravely taking I never did. Feet, his feet a very brave retreat. Much like in athletics where one catastrophic play can make a difference, here Rosecrans is discovering this as well. So I'm sure the shock and the surprise and the awe as he's looking over there and he's going to be like, wait, what? And he sees Confederate Gray and Butternut coming through those woods over there. It's got to be disheartening. He's completely taken by surprise, and that's not just a little bit of Confederates, it's 10,000 plus Confederates coming through those woods right there. Old Rosie is in trouble, majorly, and so he is going to jet from his headquarters and flee that way back towards Chattanooga. With the Confederates winning, let's take a quick timeout. Hey, I'm here in front of the Kentucky Monument, uh, and Kentucky, being a border state, will have divisions, uh, regiments for the Confederacy and for the Union on both sides. Uh, and so it's one of the few monuments that recognizes both the Confederate and Union divisions on it uh, here at this battlefield park in Chickamauga. Um, today we're also going to be looking at several Kentucky generals that mainly fought at the Confederacy and so I will be stopping here and there in the middle just to highlight uh, some of these Kentucky generals. As combat opened up on September 20th, one of the Kentucky generals is Confederate John Bell Hood. Hood was born just outside of Lexington, but when the Commonwealth joined the Union, Hood was so enraged he left the bluegrass to command Confederate troops from Texas. Eventually, he will serve under Robert E. Lee, who loved Hood for his aggressive demeanor on the battlefield. Hood served with valor in the Battle of the Seven Days and was key to Lee's attack at Gettysburg. However, Hood was wounded in the left arm at Gettysburg on July 2nd. The wound is severe enough that he will never have use of his left arm again. Uh, after the recovery at Gettysburg, he's in a sling, he actually comes back. Excited to be back with some of his old troops now who they find themselves here at Chickamauga. And again, he doesn't have use of his left arm. That is when he is, again, using Longstreet's opening that, uh, that they're moving through and getting into the Union lines. He takes a bullet right under his right hip into his leg. And that means he's going to have to have his leg amputated, his right leg amputated. Left arm useless in a sling, right leg amputated about four inches below the hip. Ouch! Well, Hood's men loved him so much, his Texas men, they all immediately 
chipped in for a prosthetic legs, which those were sort of brand new at the time. It was something like over $3,000 in that time frame. And considering that these guys were getting paid around $10 a month, that is huge that they were willing to chip in that kind of money for a general that they beloved that now is no right leg, no left arm. Hood will continue to fight even then afterwards. He is going to be promoted to the entire command after Bragg is eventually fired from Chattanooga. Hood is going to be given command of the army at the young age of 33, and he will immediately lose at Atlanta to Sherman. And then he's going to lose again at Franklin, and then he'll lose again at Nashville, and he's going to be relieved of command. So, you know, he's a great um, officer for a major general, but he's not a great leader leader because his aggressiveness cost him. Cost him at Atlanta, cost him at uh, Franklin, cost him at Nashville. After the war, real quickly about Hood, is he gets married. He has 11 children. Out of those 11 children, three sets are twins. Yeah. Three sets are twins. One set of twin, a second set of twin, and a third set of twins. So six of his 11 are twins. Unfortunately for Hood, shortly after his 11th child is born, Hood and his wife and their oldest child all get yellow fever and die, thus leaving 10 of his children as orphans. John Bell Hood was not the only Kentuckian upset with the Commonwealth joining the Union. Numerous other members of the Commonwealth felt betrayed by the slave state remaining with the Union. One such group of Kentuckians was the infamous Orphan Brigade, led by Benjamin Hardin Helm. The Kentucky First Brigade of the Confederacy, better known as the Orphan Brigade, is going to be right here in Chickamauga. So why are they better known as the Orphan Brigade? Well. They believe that the Commonwealth of Kentucky is a Confederate state. And they believe that it, Kentucky should have gone with the Confederacy since Kentucky supports slavery. But Kentucky remains Union. And so the soldiers of this first Kentucky feel like they were abandoned by the Commonwealth. And thus they are orphans. And that's why their nickname became known as the Orphan Brigade. But as I was saying, the Orphan Brigade here is finding themselves outmanned and outgunned by Union lines over there, including on that Union line is the 15th Kentucky. And so as the Confederates are starting to fall back, being pursued by Kentuckians and other Union divisions, Benjamin Helm, commander of the Orphan Brigade, is trying to rally his troops when all of a sudden he finds himself the victim of a Union sharpshooter from the 15th Kentucky, and the bullet pierces his stomach. He will stay on his horse for a few moments before falling down and eventually dying the next day of his wounds. And Benjamin Helm is going to be our next Kentucky general that we're going to talk about here at Chickamauga, because there's several things that make him unique and special, not just because he was leading the Orphan Brigade. Helm, born in Bardstown, Kentucky, went to the Kentucky Military Institute and then to West Point, where he graduated. He eventually comes back to Kentucky to study law at the University of Louisville, go cards, and eventually over to Harvard to get a degree. As the war breaks out, this is sort of why he's more of uh, a reason why we're going to focus on him here. As the war breaks out, he is offered a job by his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law gives him the opportunity to be the Union Army's paymaster. Quite a position to have. But, he, but Mr. Helm turns down his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law, Abraham Lincoln. Mary Todd Lincoln, President Lincoln's wife, her younger half-sister is married to Benjamin Helm. Upon news of his death, President Lincoln mourned deeply and passionately. It was, after all, his brother-in-law. The final Kentuckian we will examine is John Breckinridge. 
Breckenridge, the former vice president and 1860 presidential candidate, will shine brilliantly in the Confederate Army during the final weeks of the war. I find Breckenridge absolutely entertaining and engaging as, as a person to study. Uh, prior to the Civil War, right before Civil War broke out, he was the Vice President of the United States. In the election of 1860, he ran with the Southern Democrats and had a strong showing, winning most of the Southern electoral votes. When he gets into combat, uh, he's going to be at a number of the battles that we've already covered. Uh, and here, though, uh, at at Chickamauga and then on at Chattanooga, he does not get along at all with Bragg. Um, Bragg really doesn't get along with any of his officers and Breckenridge is no different. The, the two butt heads a lot. They have opposing viewpoints on how to take the war in a different direction. Um, after Chattanooga fails, Bragg's going to say that Breckenridge was drunk and that was the reason why that the battle was lost. It's not the reason why the battle was lost. But that being said, Breckenridge was known to be a uh, drunk and he was a guy that could easily drink a lot of Kentucky bourbon, sometimes appearing to be very sober after having numerous glasses of the alcohol beverage. Towards the end of the war, Breckenridge will move on to Jefferson, Davy, Jefferson Davis's cabinet, serving as the Secretary of War. And although the Confederate president is still pushing for in 1865 to continue to fight, it is our Kentuckian John Breckenridge that says, no. Matter of fact, his quote is, this has been a magnificent epic in God's name. Let it not terminate in a farce. It is going to be Breckenridge that will go down to help support Lee in his surrender uh, at Appomattox. And then from there, Breckenridge will actually go to see Joseph E. Johnson and help negotiate the surrender to Sherman there as well. Sherman actually will praise how well of a negotiator that Breckenridge is for the Confederacy. One last little final thing about Breckenridge is this. Upon the death of Abraham Lincoln, Breckenridge was visibly upset and was quoted as saying, the South has just lost its best friend. Now that we have examined three prominent Kentuckians, let's see how the battle ends. Recall how Rosecrans has fled the field. What would you do if you saw your commanding officer in full retreat? Well, for the majority of the Union Army, they're going to follow suit. But if everyone runs, there would be no one protecting the retreat from becoming a complete rout. When you see something bad, again, let me remind you, and you can make a stand against it and do something right, that is heroic. That is being a man of character, even if it means great consequences to you. General Thomas is one of these great examples of a man of character. When he sees, and he's second in line, his commander, Rosencrantz, flee the battlefield and the entire Union Army is starting to go in a retreat. Well, somebody has to protect the, the Union Army from in their retreat, otherwise they could get swallowed up and cut off. It is General Thomas here at this point in the battle takes a stand on top of these little hills right here. And he's going to take wave after wave after wave of attack, bravely holding off the Confederate lines. George Thomas was a Virginian, and when the war broke out, he remained with the Union. His family will turn his portrait against the wall and never speak with him again. Even after the war, when his southern sisters were struggling financially, George will send them money, but they will refuse it, claiming they no longer had a brother. Although his family was unforgiving, Thomas will still remain a man of character to them. As the Union was being completely routed at Chickamauga, Rosecrans ordered Thomas to retreat, but George knows if he does, the entire Union army will be in jeopardy of being captured. 
willing to put himself in harm's way for the greater good of the army, will make Thomas's stand legendary. Once General Thomas knew the remaining Union army was out of harm's way, that was, will be when he finally retreats. And for his efforts here, General Thomas, a Virginian that remained loyal to the Union, will get a most appropriate nickname of the Rock of Chickamauga. A quick side story about one of Thomas's men, though, that served under him during this heroic stand. Hold on, wait, I, I did say men. Hmm, maybe redefine that. I'm here at the 22nd Michigan Monument. This is where the 22nd of Michigan fought valiantly, but I want to tell you about one of their soldiers named Johnny Clem. The reason why I'm pointing him out is because as General Thomas's forces are finally getting overwhelmed and they're having to retreat going back to Chattanooga, the guys in this general area, they're, they're sort of in trouble. They're getting cut off uh, and a number of them are going to be captured and put as prisoners, but not Johnny Clem. Not Johnny Clem. He escapes. Well, why is his escape anything of any importance? Well, because he's 12 years old. That's why. He's a drummer boy. And he has a gun that is cut you know, to his size because aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper? Star Wars right there. Um, but, you know, when you're 12, you're, you, you need a special gun. And so he's being overwhelmed. A Tennessee Confederate colonel tries to capture him, tells him to surrender, and Johnny Clem shoots him dead. What? Yeah, he kills him. And then he runs away and gets to Chattanooga, where the U.S. Army, proud of the fact of his bravery, will promote him to be sergeant. That's right, sergeant. At the age of 12, he is the youngest person in U.S. Army history ever to be promoted that. Johnny Clem already had a legend about him. At Shiloh, he was nicknamed Johnny Shiloh because there was a piece of cannon for shrapnel that hit his drum, knocking him unconscious, but he survived. And so he had this cool little nickname, Johnny Shiloh. Now he kills a Confederate colonel from Tennessee at the age of 12 here at Chickamauga. A month later, though, he is going to be captured. This time he won't escape. He's going to be captured in October of 1863. And uh, he's, the Confederacy is going to use him as like a propaganda piece. Like, look how tough we are, but they have to send their babies to even fight us. He's not going to be too happy about being a propaganda piece. Eventually, he will be released in a prisoner exchange. And he will continue serving in the military. Uh, and he will even come to the rank of a Brigadier General and retire in, during World War I as the oldest surviving U.S. military officer uh, that will be from the Civil War. So, Johnny Clem, a.k.a. Johnny Shiloh, right there. Sort of a badass little kid. As Johnny Clem, General Thomas, and the rest of his division return to Chattanooga, they will discover a completely whipped Rosecrans. Although some of General Rosecrans' staff will suggest a counterattack on the 21st, old Rosie will simply work on surviving. Shortly after the battle, President Lincoln sent words of encouragement to Rosecrans. But in the words of the President, Rosie was confused and stunned like a duck hit on the head. There will be no counterattack by the Union Army. Meanwhile, Braxton Bragg, who had several chances to cut off the Union retreat, failed to do so, is dealing with the fallout from his own officers who believe the general is an idiot. Although Bragg won the battlefield, he failed in his objective to recapture Chattanooga. Technically, he will get the win, but is it really? Think of it, fellas. When you play Call of Duty and you don't finish the objectives, are you really winning the game? To me, not meeting the objectives and disenfranchising your officers seems more like losing than winning. Confederate General Joseph Eggleston Johnson summed up Bragg best with this quote, 
I know Mr. Jefferson Davis thinks he can do a great many things other men would hesitate to attempt. For instance, he tried to do what God failed to do. He tried to make a soldier of Braxton Bragg. The casualties for both sides were horrifically tragic. The Union will have over 16,000 casualties, whereas the Confederates will suffer just under 18,500, which included four dead Confederate generals. Chickamauga's nearly 35,000 combined casualties will be the second highest throughout the entire Civil War. And as catastrophic as Chickamauga was, consider this. It is only September of 1863, and there is still a whole heck of a lot of fighting left to go until we get to the end of this war in 1865. As Nathaniel Bedford Forrest said, war means fighting, and fighting means killing. George H. Thomas becomes the Rock of Chickamauga here. Uh, this is Snod uh, Grass Hill. It goes from the house that's about 100 yards right over there to here. And this is where he made his valiant defense. Sometimes, sometimes when things are really difficult and it would be much easier to give up and run away, you've got to do something challenging to be a heroic leader. And that is exactly what the Rock of Chickamauga is. Guys, there are going to be times in your life that will be easier to run. Will you be the rock or will you run? All right. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notifications bell uh, so you're aware of whenever we have another video coming up. Also, leave a comment. You know, Bragg gets the victory here, but is it really a victory? Because he doesn't capture Chattanooga. Is Rosencrans completely all to blame? Well, leave a comment. Leave a comment. It has been amazing. We have covered U.S. Grant's Western campaign, and now we're here at Rosencrantz Battle at Chickamauga, and we got one more stop to make, which is going to be um, the battle up at Murfreesboro, Stones River. As always, guys, remain awesome, be nice, stay safe, and I will see you soon. <laughs>